Hello and welcome to this A3 Management Consulting webinar, the next in our series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Iberian electricity market and I have a couple of colleagues with me to take us through, Javier and Angel. They'll introduce themselves uh, in just a moment. But if we skip forward, uh, first of all, to the uh, next slide, Javier, can you do that? Thank you. Through the disclaimers, here we go. That's me, Matt Brown. I'm Vice President of uh, the Ma Managed Consulting Division, um, especially uh, looking after the energy uh, area. And uh, Javier and Angel, perhaps you could just briefly introduce yourselves as well. Hello, everyone. So my name is Javier Revuelta, uh, Senior Principal in the Madrid office. Um, electrical engineer with experience in, um, in power system operation and now looking after uh, our market modeling in Iberia and Latin America. Uh, hello, good afternoon everyone. I am Angel Ballesteros. I am consultant at A3. I, I studied electrical engineering and I joined A3 three years ago. I am mainly involved in the modeling of the Spanish system. Wonderful. So there you have our, our main presenters. If we pop to the next slide, uh, just a couple of housekeeping points. So I think we have, if I'm not mistaken, we have an hour for today's um, webinar. We've got quite a lot to, to discuss. We have had a bunch of questions in the um, during the registration and uh, we uh, would ask that if you have questions during the webinar, you pop them into the question area on the uh, on the webinar panel. We will cover uh, some questions at the end, but also we do uh, follow up with people where they pose questions and get back to them individually. Uh, so uh, well worth doing. And uh, hopefully, if you've got something in particular you want to you want to raise, we can follow up with you later. Uh, the slide pack and a recording of the webinar will be available on uh, on our uh, on our website, and also we send them out to everyone who's attended uh, with a link, so you'll be able to pick them up there just in case something uh, goes wrong during the webinar for you, or you um, you know you, you miss something. Uh, so I think that's it. Other than to say that the series of our webinars that we've been doing since. Um, the uh, COVID uh, hit, we started doing a, a series of weekly webinars. Those are uh, all available, so you can go back and look at those. There's some very interesting topics, and we've, of course, got more webinars coming up. Uh, I think that's it from me. I'll come back at the end for the Q&A and moderate uh, Q&A. And with that, I'll hand it over to Javier to take us through the main, uh, main part of the material. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So today we will be covering, as Matt said, the, the uh, Iberian market. Uh, it is a moment when huge um, volumes of investments are expected with uh, this concept of uh, Greek parity, which, as many of you know, uh, has arrived, we can say, uh, since last year. Um, so lots, lo lots of um, uncertainties, not only on um, the renewable front, which will cover most of the investments, uh, with wind and solar um, taking most of the capacity being developed in, in the next few decades, but also lots of regulatory uncertainties, commodities, and security of supply. Um, on the thermal side, uh, will new capacity be developed? How much of the current overcapacity um, can, can Spain get rid of? Um, and, and what uh, will the market prices be? How will these market prices interact with the investment decisions? And then we'll cover the financial sustainability on the system, which um, which until now has been a very important topic for most investors. Uh, I think everyone has in mind the retroactive cuts uh, to the incentives uh, that the government had to apply precisely for uh, financial sustainability reasons. So we pay a lot of attention to that, and this informs a lot of our views on, on the political and, and regulatory risk. And we'll conclude with some energy policy aspects and I think so, some relevant messages for um, investors in renewables. 
So as an introduction, um, until COVID, uh, where was the Spanish system? It was uh, back to growth since 2014, with a small um, exception in 2019, uh, with, with a decrease in demand, which we think is more attributable to um, economic um, difficulties of some very large industrial consumers. Um, so there were strikes of very relevant um, consumers, but basically we do see the Spanish demand in, in a growth trend. This growth of demand, we, we, we see it is more and more decoupled from GDP. So we expect a positive GDP, but very low um, growth of what we call the base demand or residu residual demand, excluding the new uh, demand drivers, which I will cover in a minute. Uh, it's a moment when uh, a lot um, of connection requests um, had been made to the Spanish uh, TSO, Red Electrica, with um, almost 120 gigawatts uh, of combined PV and wind, uh, having not only requested connection, uh, but having been granted access uh, by the TSO, of which 44 have uh, what we call the connection agreement, which means uh, theoretically they could connect anytime if other administrative processes um, uh, are sold. It's also the year when uh, cell consumption started rising after the, um, the, the removal of the so-called sun tax. And it's the years when the political targets uh, have been set um, with an increase, uh, a target increase from 20% um, renewables over final energy by 2020 up to 42. So more than doubling uh, the, the penetration over final energy and also uh, doubling the renewal penetration over electricity from a bit less than 40% to 78% uh, in the mainland system, 74 national level, 78 in the mainland system. Uh, there's also been a new agreement to close nuclears. We will cover that because this is very different from the, um, the, the energy policy of the previous, um, govern the previous party in the government, the Popular Party, um, who are in the opposition. And it is important to keep in mind what does the opposition think about nuclear. Uh, we obviously need to consider political changes in, in the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, and it's also the years when um, CO2, uh, uh, well, 2019 is when CO2 started rising. Um, we've got several webinars on that, so I will not talk much about CO2. And, and um, lots of decisions of uh, coal closures have been announced. We were in a situation of a positive outlook um, regarding the tariff deficit, but COVID has uh, really shaken things uh, by bringing a, a, a pretty drastic reduction of electricity demand, which means um, a quite uh, relevant reduction of collection uh, of money from grid charges to pay for uh, regulated costs. So we'll cover that um, in the last slides. So if we start with electricity demand, as I said, we in the past, uh, it rose a lot until the crisis. Then we had several years of decrease quite uh, in line with GDP. From 2014, uh, the Spanish demand is back to growth, but very decoupled from, uh, from GDP. So you, you see on the right here, the blue area, uh, which is what we call the base load demand, excluding new drivers. Uh, this part we think will not rise uh, very much, but we do see electric vehicles, which you can see in gray and, and um, light blue, uh, starting, uh, well, as early as, as now, but, um, but the real penetration, uh, will increase uh, by 2030 in our views. The government has a target of 5 million vehicles by 2030, which we don't think uh, will be achieved. However, um, very high penetrations are expected during the decade. And then um, the next driver is really in the 2040s, um, the, uh, the production of uh, hydrogen through electrolysis. As of today, um, we do expect that hydrogen uh, will be produced mostly from um, other sources, from steam methane reforming. Um, however, mm, electrolysis, the, 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 the green uh, hydrogen uh, produced through electrolysis might happen before if some political support uh, is given from the EU and from the Spanish government. There's a lot of discussion around that and we will be monitoring closely the impacts of uh, uh, political support in this front, which might bring electrolysis um, earlier and higher. Um, in terms of the, the, the profile, we also expect some changes, mostly uh, driven by electric vehicles. So base load demand, we don't expect uh, big changes. We do expect some uh, from some demand response, 
also uh, potentially from distributed batteries. Um, we expect that will be in the hundreds of megawatts, not in the gigawatts of, uh, of demand shifting. And, and what you see here in, uh, in green is the potential contribution of non-responsive electric vehicles. So um, we do expect that this is as little as possible in the future uh, with right signals, price signals. Um, we should uh, have a power system where electric vehicles are charged uh, in, the, in the cheap hours when um, lots of renewables are available. However, we, we do think we, we need to prepare the system for some people charging their cars um, regardless of, uh, of power prices. So we do expect some contribution in the critical hours, which will remain after the sunset. Uh, given that this blue, uh, this blue here, it's really price responsive. It will go some days at night, some days at noon, whenever it is cheap and will not cause any problem to the system. Actually, the more it goes into the cheap hours, the better for uh, renewable capture prices and for keeping the uh, curtailments as low as possible. Okay. On commodities, we do have several webinars on, on gas and carbon. Um, and uh, as regards coal and oil, we pretty much do not care the, for the power system. Um, gas prices and carbon prices are um, more and more uh, decoupled from uh, oil. And uh, coal, uh, all of it is going to close in the coming years. So basically, we, we, we just care about gas and, and carbon um, for electricity pricing. On gas, I'll just say, because we have several webinars, that we do expect a rise from the current uh, unsustainably low prices up to uh, long-run marginal costs uh, of producing more gas, since the, the world demand for gas keeps rising. Um, so we expect gas prices in, in, in the medium and long term, uh, at least at the level of about 20 euros, 20 to 25, with some volatility for sure, but that, that's the stable levels we see. And um, as regards carbon, I'll just say that uh, during this decade until now, uh, we did see some speculative pricing, which means the fundamentals suggested uh, prices should be slightly lower than they were. Now with the new emission targets and the discussions at European level on, um, on tighter um, emission targets, um, our updated views are that prices should stay uh, at current uh, levels. Uh, for a few years and then gradually rise um, in the next two to three decades, um, very probably to triple digit uh, to enable carbon capture and storage, uh, which is uh, one of the key drivers to, um, uh, to, to achieve the decarbonization that the European Union wants. So rising gas, rising CO2. A few slides on security of supply. So for what we currently do uh, in, in the Spanish system and in, um, in, in many European systems is a, a fairly simple calculation, which is uh, checking what the install capacity is, applying derating factors, and which you see here on the right. And basically, uh, CSO, TSOs like to have a 10, at least a 10% margin. 10% means uh, more than 10% derated capacity than uh, the peak demand, where peak demand is not really the expected peak demand, but the worst demand that could be expected one winter in 10. So uh, typically in Spain, we can expect um, that a very severe winter could rise uh, peak demand by two to three gigawatts. So typically today, even though peak demand is in the fourth, uh, around 40 gigawatts, we would typically prepare for 42, 43, and then add a 10% margin on top of that. This is how things currently work. Now, um, these, um, uh, these calculations are being challenged and we think they will change uh, in the future for several reasons. We are in a new situation where uh, the current overcapacity is in negative numbers. Um, some of the CCGTs are already in negative numbers and they will gradually um, go in, more of them will go into negative as they lose their uh, current capacity payments. The government also wants to uh, close, uh, well, not only coal, which will close uh, based on economic reasons. Uh, so half, uh, about five gigawatts um, of coal have already closed uh, a couple of weeks ago. The remaining coal we think will close in the next uh, two to five years. And then on top of that, this government wants to close uh, the seven gigawatts of nuclear capacity, all of it by 2035. If we combine this uh, with um, potential increase of peak demand 
uh, coming mostly from new electrification means we may have a problem, uh, a capacity problem in the future. So basically, Europe uh, prefers first Europe prefers no capacity remuneration mechanism at all. It says my option A is energy only markets, let prices go as high as they have to be and demand will respond. Plan B or option B, if uh, a power system really doesn't like that and in Spain traditionally we haven't liked energy only markets, we don't think um, the regulators will go in this direction. Uh, Europe says plan B, um, you should evaluate the strategic reserves, which no one in Spain really speaks about. Uh, it, is an option, just not, um, just doesn't seem uh, a very likely one. Europe says then plan C, if you really want a capacity remuneration mechanism to avoid blackouts or brownouts, uh, please, uh, you need to make sure that you minimize market distortions and you need to apply probabilistic methods. You need to have a regional approach. Uh, so you need to consider probabilistic interconnections and, and contribution of neighbors. And you need to make some calculations on how much capacity is going to go into this mechanism based on a public value of loss load, which doesn't exist in most countries, definitely not in Spain. And um, the regulator is now, uh, I guess, as we speak in the coming months, uh, preparing a, a proposal uh, on how to um, evaluate uh, this figure, which is, as I'll show in a minute, is, is quite relevant to, um, to, the, to, to the capacity that the Spanish system will keep online through some potential form of um, remuneration, capacity remuneration mechanism. So. Um, the, the philosophy that we see, that which Europe seeks, and our, our interpretation of these probabilistic, how, how these probabilistic methods should be assessed. What you see here, several curves. If, if you look at the brown one, this is basically the, the, the statistical expected energy not supplied. So uh, if you draw Monte Carlo samples, um, in, in some of them, you'll find situations where uh, there is more demand than available capacity. So there, there would be some lost load. If you multiply this by the value of lost load, you get the cost, what we call here, the cost of expected energy not supplied. So this is euros. And the less backup capacity you have in a system, uh, the more uh, this figure rises, and the more backup capacity you have in the system, um, the more it tends to zero, never reaching zero, because there's always a non-zero probability that um, all thermal plants have failed, since all of them have a non-zero probability of failure. Obviously, the more you have, then uh, the lower this figure, but mathematically speaking, it could never reach zero. On the other hand, uh, what you see in the blue line is the cost of what we call insurance against shortage of supply. And this is basically simply the cost uh, of new entry um, multiplied by the megawatts of backup, where cost of new entry as of today or in the past has been typically um, the, the annuity uh, of a gas turbine. Uh, since this was the cheapest. In the future, we need to consider that potentially batteries uh, may have lower missing money. That's actually our expected um, outcome uh, during the next decade, maybe at the end of this one. Uh, and, we'll, and, and we need to think not one hour batteries, but at least four hour batteries. Um, so today, more expensive in the future, potentially cheaper. We should also consider that uh, demand response options could actually be cheaper and, and equally effective. So. Uh, I'm just showing here that this is linear. Um, the, the more backup we have or we want to pay for, then the higher the cost. So basically, the addition of these curves, the brown one, which is the risk, the blue one, which is the cost of insurance against uh, brownouts uh, or shortage, uh, where it reaches a minimum value, this is the sweet spot where regulators should aim at being in the case that regulators opt for a capacity remuneration mechanism. Okay, So there's never a capacity above which you are fully safe and below which you are at risk. Any capacity, there is some risk. And the question is, what's the cost effective uh, level of insurance? Okay. And these figures depend on cost of new entry, whatever this new entry is, and, and the value of loss load, which in Spain is to be, is to be defined. Uh, this just shows um, our um, calculation for the whole year. This is an illustrative uh, uh, simulation for the peak hour, but we do this for all hours of the year. What you see here on the right is that even though uh, for a given year 2030, for example, peak demand is around noon, we expect critical hours to be always after the sunset and typically 6 to 10 p.m. So any firm capacity that we want to bring in the system needs to be available not hour, but at least four. So um, 
this is the, 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 the practical calculations we've done for the Spanish system, uh, where zero uh, here in the, in, the, um, in the horizontal axis is the base scenario, a base scenario for 2030. You see uh, with the dashed line, um, the, the LOLE, LOLE calculation, loss of load, this is the hours, uh, the, the mathematical expectation of hours in the year uh, when demand would not be supplied. What you see in brown here is the addition of green and blue lines where, so green is the cost uh, of expected energy not supplied. Uh, blue is this cost of new entry or cost of um, extensions. Actually, if we go left of zero, which means we remove capacity for the, from the system, for example, we get rid of uh, some CCGTs. Uh, the Spanish consumers save whatever capacity payment would be given to them so that they, they keep online. So this cost of extension is typically lower than uh, cost of uh, building new, uh, new new plants. This is why the slope changes. Anyway, um, the interest of this figure is to illustrate that we have come to the conclusion that the optimal LOLE for a value of loss load, which we have picked randomly uh, at 10,000 euros, uh, we would expect an LOLE between 1.5 to 3 hours. Um, and this base scenario would be uh, by coincidence in, in the sweet spot um, of uh, backup capacity sizing, or we could eventually get rid of maybe one gigawatt uh, of, for example, CCGT being mothballed. If this figure, the relevant, to illustrate the, 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 the relevance of value of loss load, which is, uh, again, it's a political figure that um, regulator will need to come up with. If we uh, more than half this to 4,000 euros per megawatt hour, uh, which is what we get when, for example, we do this simple calculation of GDP divided by demand. So GDP is a trillion divided by demand, 250 terawatts, that's 4,000 euros per megawatt hour. And what we see is the, the minimum of this brown line, which is this uh, addition of cost and insurance or uh, risk and insurance. Um, you see that for this sweet spot uh, under this assumption of 4,000 euros, the optimal LOLE has risen to eight hours. So, and this is uh, showing the importance of this figure. It's also showing that in the future, um, in, in a more uh, digital power system and, and a smarter power system where uh, system, the, the, the grid operators will be able to target very precisely which capacity, in case of so shortage, which capacity is curtailed. Uh, obviously we would curtail first the cheapest one or the one, uh, this demand that values loss load the, the lowest. Um, actually, we can possibly get rid of a few gigawatts more um, of backup capacity and still be in, in this uh, sweet spot I mentioned. So relevant um, importance uh, of uh, value of loss load. And this is just illustrating that in Spain um, for 2020 um, capacity uh, uh, sufficient to keep an LOLE below two hours, which we consider reasonable. Um, could could uh, could be sufficient uh, getting rid of an additional 10 gigawatts um, from what we have today. So if there was some mothballing mechanism um, or if lots of CCGTs would request closures, um, at least 10 gigawatts of them, it seems, um, could mothball or close. And this in the future, depending on the base scenario in 2030, 35 and 40, depending on how much uh, of, uh, of the coal and the nuclear capacity we uh, we get rid of, we allow closures, and how much um, storage or batteries we we build here, uh, which is in positive, um, there is still a few uh, gigawatts of CCGTs which we can possibly get rid of, and this is our projections uh, after COVID, and this is always uh, we we need to monitor the, this critical demand. You see here on top uh, going from 40 to about 50 gigawatts by uh, 2040. We'll need to monitor the impact of electric vehicles, which can potentially bring this much higher. To give you um, an, an order of magnitude, if you multiply just one million electric vehicles uh, with a with a charging capacity of um, 22 gig, uh, 22 kilowatts, um, which is uh, more and more standard today, electric vehicles are charging typically at seven kilowatts. Um, at homes, it can be in the future, potentially 22 can become the standard. So a million times 22 kilowatts, that's 22 gigawatts. This obviously would be dramatic for the system. We obviously don't think this will happen, but just to give um, uh, an order of magnitude of how uh, things could go if uh, we don't have the right signals to electric vehicles. 
Now, if we move to the Spanish mm -hmm. capacity mix, um, so I separate here between renewables, storage, and uh, thermal. Uh, in terms of renewables, uh, there's a big question mark here because, uh, as I said, there are 120 gigawatts um, of solar plus wind, which has been already been um, granted um, access by the grid operators. There's even more um, waiting for an answer. And um, on the other hand, we have a, a target in the Spanish uh, National Energy and Climate Plan uh, of adding 60 gigawatts uh, of mostly wind and solar um, in order to achieve this 78% uh, renewable penetration I mentioned by 2030. Um, there's no indication beyond that. Well, the next indication is by 2050, uh, net zero emissions, so 100% by 2050. So we've done a linear trending in between. Now, so this is one extreme possibility. Uh, sorry, if the government uh, really try to enforce this uh, NECP through auctions. Now, on the other on the other end, we have the blue line. Uh, you see here, so on the left, renewable penetration. On the right, the megawatts of wind and solar combined. And this is what we see uh, that the market would lead to in absence of uh, auctions, or if the volume of auctions was below this figure. So if we expect uh, approximately three gigawatts per year on average, and the government would develop two gigawatts of auctions, there would be a combination of two from auctions, potentially one from merchant. If the government develops four, five, or six gigawatts um, of auctions, and this is very uncertain now, um, then uh, I'll come back to this later, but, uh, that, but then pretty much we can say that merchant completely dies. We don't see the market enabling any additional um, merchant projects. Um, at least with perfect foresight, you can always find someone uh, expecting high power prices, but basically economics uh, would suggest that um, merchant projects would not would no longer be viable. Okay, so two extremes, either uh, the government um, wants to play the next decade by letting the market develop some merchant and they, and they develop a, a lower level of auctions, or they, they say, we really want to achieve 100% of, of this NECP target um, and then uh, our um, our conclusions and our modeling is pretty um, it's pretty clear that only auctions can support the brown lines. Okay. Now regarding uh, thermal capacity, so I'll start with the nuclear. Uh, the government currently has a plan of closing nuclears between 27 and 35. With this trend you see here in the bars, starting in 2027. Uh, the previous government was more in favor of extending to at least 50 years. This would take us to this uh, uh, gray yellowish line you see here on the right. Our comment to this, uh, uh, to this plan, first, this plan is it's not legally binding. It's just an agreement which could be uh, changed at some point. And we just make the comments that there are other, we think other reasons will play a role in, in really um enabling this plan yes or no um there will be reasons such as security of supply uh so getting rid of some of these nuclears will depend on developing something else uh presumably storage and and also uh monitoring the peak demand and again we'll see how electric vehicles uh, potentially play against the closure of nuclears by increasing peak demand there are other issues like uh, contribution to inertia which today is not a problem but it could be in the future uh, if we have more um, non-synchronous demand connected to the system. Voltage control um, today is not an issue, but again, it could be in the future. And then uh, there are serious question marks on, uh, in our view, on the logistics of dismantling four nuclear reactors by 2030 at the same time. Um, we don't think, uh, or at least it's not at all guaranteed that uh, we will have the, the human resources and the capabilities to dismantle four of them at the same time. Uh, there's a big issue around the cost of dismantling. Right now, there's a big shortage of money to, to pay for the dismantling. Um, a plan has been calculated such that with the new taxes that nuclear uh, capacity is paying, uh, we should reach the, these, uh, the, the corresponding years with enough money. Um, in our views, um, nuclear actually in the coming decade is going to operate less and less uh, for economic reasons. Uh, so I think there's also a big question mark on the cost of dismantling. 
there are also issues regarding emissions. Um, definitely, if we get rid of nuclears, at least for quite some time until lots of renewables and storage are developed, emissions would rise. So there will be a, a discussion to have on whether we prefer we prefer nuclear waste or uh, or emissions or reducing emissions, um, and also whether we want the market more exposed to commodities or less exposed to to commodities. Um, and we finally make just the point, this, this political point that. Um, given that the opposition, at least the main party in the, in the opposition, the popular party, centre-right, uh, is more favourable to extending them, uh, I think it's relevant to, to develop scenarios where political changes could occur. Um, so several reasons for potentially not considering um, uh, those closures as granted. Um, I can tell you that a Free Central does not consider the plan, but a, a later uh, closure. And, and fewer closures by 2030. We are very aligned in terms of coal uh, with the plan. Uh, five gigawatts have been closed, the remaining four, uh, all of them will close by 2025. Well, with a small exception of, a, of the plant of Abonio, which burns uh, some gases from a steel factory. Small exception, but basically all coal uh, closed by 2025, the latest. In terms of uh, CCGTs, uh, what you see here in, in the green line uh, for from 20 well what you see in the green line is the the capacity that has capacity that has some capacity payments today uh, of 10000 euros per megawatt what you see in 2010 is the um, the year when uh, this value was the highest and and from 2013 um the number of ccgts the, the 50 turbines uh, that we have started losing uh, this capacity payment what you see in green is the CCGT's um, capacity that will keep uh, the 10,000 uh, euros capacity payment. Basically, what this is showing is this is a proxy of how many CCGT's can be in a healthy situation uh, and or at least positive situation and how many are potentially not in a healthy situation if uh, they don't manage to recover from the market alone their OPEX, uh, which is the case for most of them. Uh, especially as more and more renewables will come in the system. So what we are saying here is um, not all of them can close. Uh, potentially, if nothing is done, um, the market we think would be insufficient to, let's say, keep the lights on. Uh, see if, 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 we, if we let close every CCGT that wants to close. And therefore, some CRM at some point is likely to come in our views uh to not not to bring new capacity in the system but prevent uh, to prevent some existing capacity from closing and therefore uh taking the the spanish uh, system in in a, in a risky situation so the exact volume as i said earlier will depend on value of lost loads um on evolution of peak demand and so on but we think that a few ccgts can be um either mothballed well definitely mothballed and some of them even uh closed now, as regards storage, lots of people think that uh, a lot of storage will come in the system. Um, there, there are high expectations with batteries reducing their capex and, and coming profitable at, uh, becoming profitable at some point. Well, our numbers are, again, pretty clear that by even by 2030, even with some capex reduction, reduction assumptions, uh, pretty heavy reduction assumptions of uh, the capex of batteries, still the economics um, of batteries or any technology you see here, so two hour batteries, four hour batteries, pump storage, hydro or solar CSP, uh, or any other storage uh, that you can think of, we think will not be profitable if uh, the, the only revenue stream is a price arbitrage from uh, the day ahead market. There's, there's some potential upside from ancillary services, but it doesn't change this conclusion that uh, with the current regulation, no storage uh, seems profitable, even in uh, even if the NECP was achieved, even in a scenario with lots of renewables and, and, and very high frequency of low prices, still the numbers um, are pretty clear that the economics are, are, are not good for storage. Again, if the single revenue stream is uh, price arbitrage. And what you see here in blue is how much money they would collect from the market. What you see in brown is how much uh, the missing money would be uh, for different CapEx assumptions. Potentially, if CapEx reduces even further than the figures you, you see here in, in the bars, um, at some point, maybe a first megawatt of storage uh, could be economic. But actually, we see that the risk of uh, cannibalization of price arbitrage uh, from storage is very, very fast, meaning that even if we are in a, in a situation where the first gigawatt uh, of batteries becomes profitable because they would make enough money, 
um, to cover the, the annuity and the OPEX, the additional one or two gigawatts coming in the system would completely destroy the price arbitrage and, and make uh, these batteries go again into negative. So we don't see uh, merchant storage, at least for 2030. Now, uh, does this mean we think storage should not come in the system? Not at all. Um, we actually think storage should come in the system, even though it, it, will, it will cost some incentive. Uh, and this is because the more storage we develop, um, and what you see here is several scenarios where in each of them we are enforcing a 77% renewable penetration by 2030, um, 77 over final, uh, sorry, over electricity. Um, and the more storage we have in the system, then the lower the oversizing we need of wind and solar, the lower the curtailments, and the higher the capture prices uh, for both wind and solar. And um, the, so the lower the economic incentive for, this wind, for wind and solar uh, uh, projects. So basically more storage costs more money, but it enables saving money on the incentives to wind uh, and solar. So what matters, what should matter to regulator is the addition of both. And what you see here is that scenarios with uh, either more capacity, uh, so five or 10 gigawatts of storage capacity um, or several hours of storage. So four hour batteries or pump storage, which uh, we consider would have uh, a lot more than four hours, depending on whether it's a pure pump storage or um, or a mixed inflow storage could have uh, a lot more than 10 uh, or even 50 hours. And uh, CSP, we expect uh, future designs would come with at least eight to 10 hours of uh, thermal storage. What we see is that we, uh, the, 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 ins the annual incentives to, to the storage is the, the orange, which you, which you see rises, but then it enables reducing the green, which is um, the incentives to uh, new renewables. Okay, so it's the addition of both, plus actually the 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 uh, the cost of uh, these backup uh, capacity remuneration mechanisms to keep uh, the lights on, as we say, which also reduces when we have more storage because basically we can get rid uh, of more thermal megawatts. Okay, so as you see, storage costs money; it costs the orange, but it takes the system into a, a lower total system cost. Therefore, it is cost beneficial for the system to develop storage. How much? We think between five to 10 gigawatts. And, and this will depend on uh, which technologies um, are the, the, the winners of the future. I think a, a relevant point here on um, concentrating solar power, uh, it's counterintuitive that given today's cost, which everyone has in mind, uh, are triple digit compared to, to the, the, the 20s or 30s or 40 euros of wind and solar. How come a system with CSP seems to be cheaper? Well, actually CSP, uh, it brings several things. It brings firm capacity because it has 10 hours of storage and with some heaters, it can actually uh, have the tanks 100% charged, even if it is cloudy uh, by consuming uh, electricity from the grid and, and melting the, the molten salts. Uh, so it brings capacity, it brings um, storage and it brings renewable megawatts. So it brings three things and when you put all those three things uh, and design a power system with CSP, we actually do come to this conclusion that potentially, uh, and, and, and this is very conditional to the future capex that, that CSP will have, um, this could, could potentially be even cheaper than, than other options. Um, we, so we are assuming some capex reduction here, um, quite aligned with the capex that uh, Chinese manufacturers state uh, they have uh, already as of today for this uh, design of CSP plants uh, with very high load factors and, and with some um, uh, with these 10 hours uh, of, of storage. Um, so whether it's CSP or pump storage hydro or batteries and PV, this will depend on costs. Um, as you see, numbers are pretty close uh, and clear who the winner will be. But anyway, I think an important conclusion is the system with storage is cheaper, even though uh, storage we would cost money uh, to consumers. And this is, well, when we add power uh, pool prices, which do rise uh, because storage reduces the frequency of curtailments and therefore rises the, the base load and the capture prices, um, it makes things a, a bit more even. But we still, we still see that between five and 10 um, actually uh, gigawatts of storage actually lead to cheaper uh, system costs. 
in terms of timings, when can storage come? To keep it short, we don't see batteries much before 2025. We don't see uh, pump storage hydro, which is one of the potential winners, uh, especially mixed inflow uh, from existing uh, rivers that could um, replace or uh, either replace their turbines or add simply add uh, pumps uh, and make uh, conventional hydro into into a mixed uh, inflow storage. We don't see that happening much before 2030 um, because of timing. So we, what you see here on the right is the timing we expect to develop a framework for storage. So as of today, there's no regulation for the government, for the regulators to develop um, an auction for storage. It just doesn't exist. How should it be paid? How do we put in competition different uh, storage options? We do. We would expect very minimum one year, potentially two years to develop such a framework. It's really not an easy task, even though it's a regulatory issue. We, we, it's, uh, it definitely has some options, but we think it's it's going to take uh, quite some time to to come up with with a nice option that uh, that's compatible with uh, European guidelines and with uh, with national regulation. We would expect potentially another year uh, to award uh, the winners of said uh, scheme, and then at least a couple of years so you the, the 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 blue area here is what we would expect for batteries but pump storage which would make investment decision by 2023 we don't see less than six or seven years not to say 10 years to develop a pump storage so it's going to be tricky to have um, the plant capacities which you see here uh, 3.5 uh, pump storage 2.5 batteries and and 5 gigawatts of csp by 2030 uh, it's going to be very challenging, um, and in AFRI Central, we actually do not consider that uh, this is likely. There are several options. Well, we we expect um, uh, we we propose a market um, in in terms of regulation. We expect a more full market participation with a competitive bidding, and there are lots of details here to be discussed. We're happy to uh, to discuss about these options uh, in another occasion. Uh, wholesale prices. What do we see? So this is price duration curves. Um, what you see here is uh, for, for illustrative scenarios, the brown one uh, would correspond to uh, the next few years with few curtailments, uh, and then black and blue correspond to 20, 2030, 2040. Uh, these are illustrative scenarios, and we expect a lot more curtailments as more wind and PV um, come in the system. Uh, on the other hand, we do have some elements which keep uh, curtailments down such as interconnections, pump storage, price responsive demand, uh, especially price responsive electric vehicles. So the more of those elements we have, the better for capture prices. And then uh, most of the hours in the year uh, will be driven by gas uh, and CO2 prices. What you see here is um, our simulation of the NECP scenario by 2030. And you see several scenarios, which we call zero, it's exactly the NECP as formulated by the government. And one, two, three are simply what if scenarios with less interconnection, we don't think that the planned or the stated uh, uh, three interconnections of the NECP, we think just one will go forward, not three. Um, and then there are question marks on the closures of nuclears, and there are question marks on the development of storage. Will it arrive on time, yes or no? So basically, these are what if scenarios, what would happen if um, these very ambitious volumes of renewables are developed? Um, with less interconnection, closing fewer nuclears and, and less storage. Uh, whatever the final scenario is, as you see in all cases, lots of curtailments and, and prices very cannibalized. Um, actually, they are so cannibalized in, in all these scenarios um, that um, something we uh, clearly see is that these scenarios are only possible with auctions that would complement cannibalized power prices with an additional revenue stream, which would be the contract for difference um, uh, with uh, fr from the uh, award of these uh, of the of the tenders, with no tenders, um, no no auctions for renewables. Uh, simply this this would not happen because investors would stop investing much before we get to this point. Um, so these are basically the elements uh, that contribute to capture prices or uh, or new build high. Uh, I mentioned them with the previous slide. So I'll go to this one, which I think is very interesting uh, as it shows um, potential range of LCOE of future projects. Now the LCOE, uh, this is not the capture price, but just 
so this is intrinsic to, to each project. What is, based on its capex and opex, what is the LCOE, uh, as you know, represents the average revenue that a project should receive over its lifetime to reach its hurdle rate, and therefore to make an investment decision. As you see, there's a pretty high range. Uh, so in the continuous lines, you see um, expected LCOEs for merchant projects with uh, higher hurdle rates. And the same projects, if they would bid uh, for a feed-in tariff, uh, simply because they would, uh, they would request, they would have lower hurdle rates, they could live with much lower figures. Now, what the, the, this is neither a maximum nor a minimum of what capture prices will be in the future. However, this sets a trend of what capture, the order of magnitude that, uh, of what capture prices could be without externalities. And without externalities, I mean neither negative nor positive. So, um, for example, a positive uh, or a negative externality would be um, there's a, a market for, uh, for example, 20 gigawatts until we reach this figure. Uh, for example, for 2030, if we take, let's say, an average project which would have an LCOE of, let's say, 30 euros, um, is m market prices would get close to this figure in absence um, of bottlenecks for development. If the system is not able to develop uh, capacity that fast, then capture prices will stay higher. And then, uh, and so this would be a negative externality. If, uh, on, the, on the other hand, a positive externality would be the government saying, well, we actually want more than 20 gigawatts. And if power prices go too low, uh, it will not matter because um, there will be an auction. So we organize an auction where uh, we top up market revenues uh, with the CFD, and, which makes the project financeable and viable. So, and this is a risk that I think investors um, maybe don't understand uh, well. Power prices can theoretically go below LCOE levels. And how much, uh, how low they can go depends on uh, the volume of auctions and um, how, how, how the market behaves, uh, depending on interconnections, electric vehicles, and so on. Um, so this does set a trend in absence of uh, auctions or in presence of a low volume of auctions. Um, but these prices could be exceeded um, or, um, or go even below, uh, depending on, on, on the regulatory choices. Uh, we do think that in a free central, uh, we do think that actually the market uh, will drive investments, but then uh, this comes also with the belief that the NECP will not be achieved. If, the, if we would believe that the NECP will be achieved uh, with these five to six gigawatts of auctions um, and with no bottlenecks in the development, possibly our message to investors would be, uh, you should wait for the auctions uh, because uh, numbers uh, strongly suggest that we will, that, that we will go into, into negative figures. Uh, but there's a big question mark. We don't have the answer and we'll need to keep monitoring that um, on what the volume of auctions will be. Um, so there's a big question uh, for you uh, as investors, um, what you prepare for. And I'm showing this concept here. Uh, a lot of people think that there is grid parity because what you see here, the dashed line is um, the, L the evolution of LCOE for PV. What you see in black is base load prices, in orange, uh, capture prices. Uh, you would expect since capture rates right now are uh, close to 100%, you would say, yes, there is grid parity, we can invest merchant in Spain, in the Spanish market. Now, the, the comment to this is, well, if future capture prices, the orange here, uh, they do as shown here in a very illustrative uh, scenario of future market prices, Yes, we confirm there is grid parity. As you see, average of future capture prices is, be, is above uh, 32 euros here in this example, uh, just an illustrative example, and therefore the holder rate is achieved. If you look at the right scenario, this is a scenario where either commodities have gone down or uh, the Spanish market has been flooded uh, in the good sense. Uh, it has been flooded with renewables and lots of curtailments happen. And if you do the uh, average of this orange curve on the right, uh, or you calculate the IRR of these cash flows, basically they're telling there is no grid parity. Uh, and this is why I call the starting situation, starting grid parity or apparent grid parity. Um, I personally would call um, grid parity uh, that we are on the left situation um, and not on the right. So uh, it is absolutely relevant to have a view on future market prices uh, to say whether your project uh, is at grid parity, yes or no. 
And here I will um, leave the micro to my colleague Angel, who will talk about uh, the financial sustainability of the system. Thank you, Javier. Uh, so in this part of the webinar, we will talk about the financial sustainability of the electric system. We will analyze the evolution over the last years, and then we will focus on the impact of the COVID-19 and the consequences in the short and the long term. So if you go to the first slide. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, to clarify the concepts, in addition to the generation cost paid through the pool, uh, the electric system has also some regulated costs, which are mainly the transmission and distribution networks, the subsidies to renewables, CHP and waste, what we have called here recording, uh, the capacity payments, the past deficit, etc. Uh, these costs are paid by the incomes that come mainly from the access tolls paid by the consumers, but they can also come from the national budget or taxes. When the costs are higher than the incomes, a deficit appears. And this is exactly what happened in the Spanish system from 27 to 2013. Uh, during these years, the cost of the subsidies to renewables increased dramatically and the regulated incomes decreased due to a lower demand as a consequence of the crisis. Uh, these two factors led to annual deficits of around 5 billion, reaching an accumulated deficit of 30 billion by 2013. In, in this situation uh, of deficit, of deficit uh, the government published in December 2013 the Law 24, the law of the electric system. Uh, this law introduced the concept of financial sustainability of the system that states that annual deficits above 2% of the income or accumulated deficits above 5% will lead to the obligation to review the tolls or charges. In addition to this, uh, the government also introduced several measures to tackle the deficit issue by reducing costs of renewable subsidies and also increasing revenues from taxes and from the national budget. With all these measures, the system experienced a period of financial stability from 2013 to 2018 with a small annual surpluses and reaching an accumulated surplus of 1 billion by the end of 2018. If you go to the next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, here we are showing the provisional settlement for 2019 and also our projections for the final settlement of 2018 and the years 2020 and 2021. In 2019, uh, there was a decrease in, in the incomes of the system due to a slightly lower demand than expected, but mainly due to the measures introduced in the Royal Decree 15, which were the elimination of the green cent for gas and the temporary suspen suspension of the, of the generation tax. Uh, despite this, uh, we expect that the final settlement will be far from the 1.2 billion deficit of the provisional settlement since some money from taxes and CO2 is still to come. The final, fee, the final deficit figure that we expect is more in the range of 300, 400 million. That can be covered by the accumulated surplus. And in this case, the accumulated surplus will be reduced to 600 million. For 2020 and 2021, uh, we expect a decrease in some costs, mainly the subsidies to renewables since as a consequence of the high pool prices that we had over the last years, over the last three years, uh, the recalculation of subsidies for the next semi-period, for the semi-period 2020-2022, has led to a cost decrease of around 1 billion. Uh, we can also expect a reduction in the transmission and distribution cost due to the lower reasonable return and also reductions in the annuities of uh, the past deficits. With all these cost reductions in a pre-coronavirus scenario, we could have expected surpluses of around 1 billion in these two years that could have a load to reduce to the, the generation tax. You no, know, that as you probably know, uh, causes distortions in the wholesale market. However, uh, since the coronavirus outbreak began, uh, the electricity demand has suffered a decline that we estimate of around 8.5% in 2020 with a rebound in 2021. Uh, this lower demand translates into lower income from access tolls that, as you can see here in our projection, 
this reduction of income could lead to a deficit of around 600 million in 2020, in 2020 with a rebound in 2021, leading to a small uh, surplus in 2021. Uh, this situation would mean that this deficit could be covered by the accumulated surplus with no need to apply the coverage coefficient or even increase the access tools. Uh, however, this equilibrium that we are showing here is very weak and it depends on the one hand uh, that the government is not tempted to use the effective separation between tolls and charges that is expected to happen in 2021 to reduce the effective collection of tolls plus charges. In fact, increases the charges will be the easiest way to avoid deficit, but given the current situation of the country, uh, we think that this is not very likely to happen. Uh, on the other hand, this equilibrium needs the, stem, the external contribution uh, to the system to remain at similar levels of recent years. Uh, this, external, um, this external contribution could come from the CO2 auctions, from specific funds of the national budget, or even from taxes. Uh, for example, we have estimated that the recovery of the green sand for gas uh, could bring 200 million for the system. Uh, to sum up, in the short term, we foresee a weak equilibrium in the system that mm, probably will lead to deficits. But uh, however, this is not the consequence of uh, a structural problem. This is uh, something that can be easy, easily controlled uh, with minor corrections. And here you can see the, the, our projections for the long, long term, uh, where, where we have uh, mainly good news from the cost side. Uh, the subsidies to renewables will be gradually falling due to the end of the regulatory life of many assets and also between 2025 and 2028 2.5 billion from the annuities of past deficits will disappear uh, although it is also true that we will probably see the payment for networks increasing due to new, new investments and also potentially the system uh, could have to pay around two and three a billion from arbitration process against the Kingdom of Spain, although this is not clear yet. In general, in the long term, we see that uh, these cost reductions, uh, together with the expected recovery of demand, uh, will generate surpluses, leading to the possibility of removing the, the generation tax before 2025. Uh, moreover, up to 2025, the surpluses will be even higher, and future governments will be able not only to reduce charges, but they will also have money to do the necessary investments to carry out uh, the ecological transition. And just a final comment here about the new renewable options, which depending on the volumes auctioned by the government and the market prices, uh, they could represent an income or a cost for the system. If the volumes auction, auctioned by the government are lower than those included in the NECP, the capture prices will not fall as much and the and this auction uh, will mean, especially in the short term, an income for the system. Uh, however, in any case, the draft of Royal Decree published by the government in the last weeks states that the premiums for renewables will be paid uh, through the final hourly price and not as a regulated cost. Uh, not as a regulated cost. Uh, so this will not impact on the on the economics of the system and this will not be translated into a reduction of charges. So that's all for, for me say. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so since we are uh, 30 seconds after time, I'll just summarize in, in, in a couple of sentences that this decade, really the big question is that we have, um, and therefore you should keep in mind as an investor is um, how does the government want to play this decade in terms of um, incentivizing renewables? Do they want um, to let the market uh, operate, which is basically what the sector has been requesting in the last few years? They've been asking, please, government, don't do anything. Uh, lots of projects will come in the system um, uh, through, through merchant uh, projects or through PPAs. Um, that's one option. Uh, the government if they want to achieve the NECP uh, strictly, they will need to develop lots of auctions, which uh, in our numbers are very clear. 
um, that they basically destroy merchant, they destroy PPAs. Um, so a big uh, question mark here on, on the government's target uh, and, and how they want to play this, not only this government, but future governments. And I will leave it here. Um, and Matt, we are one minute out of time. Um, we can either take one question, maybe. Um, we are anyway very happy to uh, respond to questions uh, bilaterally or, or through email. Yeah, so I think we'll just um, we'll do one quick question, Javier. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for that. Um, the Spanish market is uh, is always complex and a lot of stuff going on. Of course, the guys in Madrid are uh, on top of uh, on top of everything. Um, I'll ask one question, Javier. Is uh, questions coming? Is it necessary uh, for to have some sort of reform of the spot market? Which is a question that quite often comes up. You know, if we have a huge yeah. amount of renewables, inflexible renewables, do we need to reform the, the market design? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good open question, uh, which indeed many people ask. Well, uh, my answer to that would be uh, that not necessarily. Uh, what we do see if, uh, at least in this decade and possibly next decade, if we want to move into this direction of very, very high uh, renewable penetrations, uh, is that the market definitely will not deliver that. So if um, uh, what we see works is a complement to, uh, to, to lots of investors. So definitely to, um, to renewables uh, by topping up, topping up uh, very cannibalized power prices uh, with a CFD coming from auctions. Also to uh, CCGTs, uh, potentially also to nuclear that could not live with uh, very, very low prices. So the market, I would say, can work as it is, simply with complements uh, for almost everyone. Um, second thing is, actually, there is no alternative. If any, lots of people say uh, the market should be reformed, we would be happy to, I mean, th there are different things that can be done, uh, but there's no firm proposal uh, really on the table. So there, there's no alternative. And actually what Europe wants is a market like this where uh, very extreme prices, either zero or even negative, um, or very high, uh, going to the 3,000 that Euphemia allows, um, this is supposed to drive uh, new investments in storage, in energy efficiency, um, interconnections, and so on. Uh, so I don't think uh, anyone should count on a reform uh, between 2030, potentially even 2040. Um, and that's Lovely. what Europe expects. Thank so you for that. Yeah, okay. we would, uh, and of course, we'd be very happy if uh, there was a uh, a reform of the market. Maybe we could do the uh, the market rules as, we, as we've done in uh, in other geographies. That would be very interesting work to do. Um, I think with that, I'll draw the webinar to a close. I'll thank again Javier and Angel, and uh, also. Uh, Johnny and Ericsson and Bev, who uh, are helping with these uh, webinar series. The next webinar is next week. It's about the Indian power market, a vision for 2030, um, based on some work we've been doing recently in uh, for the Indian, uh, with regard to the Indian power market. So um, with that, thank you very much and uh, hope to uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.